Yeah. Good. Uh, have me too. Wrong slides. Mm. Almost the same title, but uh, this is Tappers. Um, actually, I realized I didn't talk about Tappers last part, but I will do it this day. So, now. So, as I said, basically we have two main reasons or to use multiple sequence alignments. Or and one was ever described by Cyblas was this kind of iterative search or a way to find more homologs, basically homology detection, which is a key concept. And it's really a huge difference in how powerful it is compared to just using single sequences. As you saw in the first round of blast, I found three, four sequences. If I run this delta blast, I found uh, 100. The same database, actually the same se sequence search, se sequence search time basically. And uh, in by just using this multiple sequence information. <coughs> so I will uh, um, but uh, this is the second use of machine learning or, or, or multiple sequence diamonds. And that's in the machine learning or in the pattern recognition. Basically, that is, you can extract information that is not necessarily homologous. It's not, not, not homology information, it's more, much more general information from um, a sequence, or for, particularly from a multiple sequence alignment. So, for instance, a typical example would be signal peptides. So, signal peptides are small peptides from some begin, uh, parts of the sequence that are put in, on the end terminal part of a pro protein. And, uh, they are used for guiding the protein to different parts of the cell. So there are signal peptides, there are a few different signal peptides. It's not the only way to guide the protein, but it's one way. And these are, of course, they are they have particularly particular patterns. So they're very they are have specific um, um, features that of course the machinery that sort the cells recognize, but they're not directly evolution related. So that all the signal peptides has one common origin. Have probably evolved several times, so it's, it's, it's so, so it's so there are features that are not direct necessarily homology. Now other examples are as I talked about secondary structure. So you can from the multiple sequence elements you can guess if it's a beta sheet or a apohilis, and that is certainly not not that's the proof that are not homologous that have beta sheets both of them, and you can try to extract information from from a multiple sequence alignment. So so. And there are many, many other types of patterns. So I will talk a bit about uh, how this is used in, in bi bioinformatics, particularly from sequences. And then I will talk a bit about general, about machine learning. So machine learning is basically a common term to teach how you tell a computer to learn something. It's not, it's not like when you write a program, you tell it to do this, do this, do this. Instead, you tell it to tell it learn to recognize uh, a cat, and you don't don't do it by telling you the cat looks like this, this, this. You tell it by providing examples of cats and non-cats, and then you try to figure it out itself. So I talk about two such machine learning methods: artificial neural networks, and support vector machines. There are many others. Hidden Markov models, we've talked about before, is also machine learning methods in one way that is used in, in bioinformatics also. And uh, this past we we'll talk about a bit. So as, yeah, as we said before, we use multiple sequence alignments to improve the technology <coughs> process. We also <coughs> create palinated trees, which actually I haven't talked about, but I'll talk about tomorrow. And we can do homology that can be proved by proof files in the market models. And Cybos is a good method here. Delta DOS is even faster nowadays. Alright, Bay Delta is basically one kickstart of Cyblast. Palinated trees can be created using three methods. Parsimony, I'll just skip it, we'll talk about tomorrow. And the domains are well, this also I will talk about later. I haven't talked about that yet. But a pattern. So pattern is something. I mean, it was already long time, well, well, long time ago. But people discovered that some 
for instance, an active site of a specific pattern. And it doesn't have to be homologous proteins. So like you have a serine, act, serine peptidase signal, peptidase and serine active site. So the active site in, in, in peptidases, in one group of peptidases, have this pattern. So it means that the proline, aniline, uh, glycine or serine, something, serine, methylene, something, proline, uh, aniline or threonine, some, uh, leucine or phenylalanine. So it's very, very strict rules. It's exactly that, that, well, that, 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 one of these two, that, 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 well, something here, something there. This problem is concerned with then one of these two and one of these two. And you can, and you can have, you can mark things that is zero to one residues in between and things like that, so you can make some length variation. So this is like if you have A, D, C, C, and one T, all these three sequences match this pattern. So between it's A and then D or C, and then zero to one residues and then a T. Or nucleotides in this case. So th these are patterns people have uh, developed uh, early when you when you had many few sequences. You say, ah, oh, this is how it active site of serine, serine single peptidase. And other patterns, and you had patterns for single peptides, so a lot of patterns for different things that you evolve, evolve manually. There are some automatic ways to do it, but they are not very, well, it's not the best way to do it, let's put it that way. But anyway, from such a like, if you have here features that are basically multiple sequence alignment, but the, the, you don't have to believe that the homologous autism, it can be a small part here. You can make a peptide method, method like that. It's still used in some way for like um, the methods for doing it for uh, transcription factor binding sites. So if you transcription factor is something that regulates the gene expression of a gene, so it binds to the DNA somewhere closer to the gene. And often, often you don't know exactly where it binds. You have an idea, and it's so, but the you basically take. Okay, I know it binds here, and then I try to find a pattern, and you have many, many examples. And you try to find some pattern matching that actually matches all these and say, ah, this is what it binds. Because that's the, the basically your underlying sequences together. And I might need to use a statistical model for it. A good way to actually dis describe this or get this pattern is what's called the sequence log. So this is just basically, there's no matter for training anything, it's just a way to visualize a, mu a multiple sequence alignment. Uh, So basically, what you do is you do log logos. So basically, you, you type the letters that are found in one position, but you do it in such a way so that the height in this position is dependent on the uncertainty it has been decreased. So basically, it's actually the, entro uh, the entropy. Uh, so, uh, ah, this is, you can read the negative. Um, so this is Schrödinger, Shannon, I mean. So the, yeah, you can define the entropy as the sum of probability to find some, well, basically the frequency of something, times the log of probability to, that the frequency is found. And also use the base log 2, you yeah, know, not log, no one, not the So basically, if it's something completely conserved, it will have a high number. If it's completely random, it will have value of zero. So that's, that's the entropy of one position. It's exactly the same way as you define entropy in a gas, basically. Uh, so then you, do, you can do a log like this. So this is a Tata box by the side log. So you can see here, you have a number of sequences, and you have them aligned. So you have a TATA. So what you see here is that in position zero, which is the third T, or say my second T, the third position, you have basically. Well, you can see on the minus one position, you have only A. So this is log two is two. So you only have two bits of information, so completely 100% conserved in this data set for 40 set by inside. But so there's nothing else. In position minus two and zero, there are T's, but there's some, some small probability to be in A also. And you see that the height of these letters together is lower. And in the third position, there's A, but it can also be some probability to be T. And then you can see basically that. In this position of after it, it's not completely random either, because when all the information is much lower, it is still not down to zero, which is basically zero position minus three. But in position two and three, there are maybe 
half a bit or a bit more, and it's mainly A and T's. So there is some information even there. So, there's a, so, there, so from this you can make a profile profile, or a, you can make a uh, path to say T A T A, but you could allow A here, but you can have a lower score for A, so that, and you can say that okay, it's good to have another A or another T afterwards. Also, these and C's are very rare here. Well, this procedure doesn't matter what you have. So, okay, so th this is uh, just another way to visualize m uh, multiple things alignment, but we'll, we will use it later. Okay, so one key thing here when you do this, so th th this you can basically do a profile or a path, <coughs> and you can search database for all these things, you have probabilities. But the key thing here is that we do not, in this case, we do not use m negative examples. Uh, so we don't know, we, we don't know, know, know the background or something. We can have a statistical model for it, but and we can. There are also things we cannot learn. For instance, assume that this a here follows that is an a here should also be an a here. But so there are so you, you never have t a a a. You always have a a a t. For instance, if you have the a here, so there, so there are relationship between different positions. This is something that in a simple profile, even in the mark models we did here, we cannot take into account. Because every state is dependent, independent of everything else. So there are more complex things you can think about there that could be dependent. So this is what you can do in the machine learning methods. You can basically learn it, and what you do is you present positive, so examples that are known to be a part of a class, or things like that, and negative examples. So this is the page I printed for you, and it's uh, well, from last year at least, uh, and it's uh, basically it defines machine learning as a scientific discipline that is concerned with design and development of algorithms that allow computers to learn based on data, basically per data, such as data from sensors or databases. A major focus of machine learning research is to automatically learn to recognize complex patterns and might make intelligent decisions based on the data. Therefore, it's closely related to statistics and other fields. Uh, so in many cases, if the data is simple, you can just do some simple statistics, or simple you have statistical methods. But if it's a complex pattern you want to learn, the machine learning methods are me much better. So there are two terms in machine learning that you often do, called classification and regression. So classification is that basically I want to say A or B or C or one, uh, two groups or one two groups. I want to classify them into one group or another. Regression is basically I want to fit things to a line, so a curve. So I say this is a zero, this is a point A, so we give a number. So they are, and basically often I can use the same algorithm to do both things. So these, these are, most of the bioinformatics examples we use are classification, and often what we do, but there are cases when you do want to do regression also. And often it's easier to train classification because it's easier for it to learn. But there are cases when you, for instance, if you, if, you are, if you want to make a method that classifies how much one amino acid is exposed to the surface of a protein, which is an example that people don't, that is of course, you, you can define amino acid as buried or exposed, but there's always going to be a gray zone. There are things that are 100% barred, 100% exposed, but there are also the ones that are half barred and things like that. But so you can do it both ways. It doesn't really matter so much in the, in, in the performance normally. More terms? You have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi supervised learning. So learning is basically the, the math machine, the computer should learn something. And you can either have supervised, it means that all the training examples are labeled. So basically you say this is a set of training examples. I know that this is the one group and this is another group. There are also cases where you actually don't know how things are related. You don't know if you want to find uh, something that's not known. You can try to just basically cluster it. You can use unsupervised learning. You try to all the features that distinguish these. And then afterwards you can try to figure out what it actually is. In those cases, we are going to call semi supervised learning. So basically, I have a few examples labeled, but the bulk is not unlabeled. But normally, what I talk about today, what we normally discuss is often supervised learning. You know the examples, 
and you want to be able to generalize it to other cases. So this is like just a two-dimensional way of displaying it. So you have uh, two groups of pa patients, and you can measure LDL and HDL, so kind of fat, uh, fatty acids in the blood. And then you have patients that get cardiac disease, and the one who don't. So you can see here just, and you have two, these two measures. You can see basically, yeah, if you are low in LDL, it's quite good. You don't get disease. But uh, what is not there? So like, and but also if you're high in LDL, but also high in HDL, it's not that bad. It's quite unlikely to get this disease. So you, you would like to have, but then there are cases where you can't see this is mixed with everything else. It doesn't explain everything in this case. Uh, but you would like to have a curve that kind of separates the red group from this one, maybe something like that. So if you below there, and then, then it's, it's like the best possible separation of these groups. Uh, well, it's the same curve, but uh, you can do it on mRNA levels, maybe. So you measure some amount of two, two genes that are expressed. And what we want to do is basically is to ask if I have this number here. I have, a, I have a new new patients that I haven't seen before that has these numbers. How likely is it that these patients will get heart disease or not? If it's very likely, I should maybe monitor more closely and take care of better care of patients. If it's very unlikely, I can let him or her go home. So first you can do Simple statistical, you can make a separation here, you can make a line like that, basically, and say, okay, if you're on this side line, we monitor you closely, if you're this side of the line, no, don't monitor you closely, because it's only two out of, it's only 20 percent risk here, here's 80 percent risk to get heart disease. But you could maybe try to make a more, but this is just two dimensions, what happens if you have 20,000 dimensions, so you have 20,000 mRNA levels, which ones are informative, which ones are not. But this is a typical example of where machine learning will be used. But it tells what should we do with this patient there. Um, well, you basically can do something that you can also do unsupervised learning, and you basically then try to separate these two groups together. But if you skip this. Okay, so one method. Um, that is one of the oldest methods in this field is artificial neural networks. It's kind of, uh, it's perhaps not the best method any longer, but it's, it's still used. And if you are good at using it, you can really do good, good performance of it. And it's kind of the basic of many, many other things. Uh, so it's, uh, so the, and the idea is somehow, also with machine learning, it's like somebody is like, we're trying to simulate the brain, and we're trying to make uh, uh, let the computer behave like a neuron. It's not really true, because if you really look at mathematically, you actually do something quite different, but there are at least these ideas. There was even, I think, I think two weeks ago, there was IBM introduced some specific new chip that actually was based on this idea that basically tried to emulate the brain by doing many different things on very, very small hardware. Um, you can do supervised and unsupervised networks, there are many different ty several different types. Uh, I will take talk a bit more about the normal, normal version that we use is feed forward, and I will give you one example of an application which is target P, which is a biological problem that is aimed at separating or uh, predicting if a s protein should go to the mitochondria, chloroplast, or be exported or be in the cytosol. So the whole thing about the neural network is basically try to somehow emulate the neuron. Uh, and the idea here is very much the word is like um, when we are, if we see a tree outside, we can basically say we recognize trees. But it's not so easy to tell that's a computer. Uh, and uh, so we, the idea was also, okay, we know how the neuron works, we can try to let the computer do the same thing. Uh, and uh, 
The key word here is probably generalize. Uh, so that really, we would like to do it for a general problem, not for one particular task. Because oh, this is a trigger, you recognize the pattern. This is a trigger, you can. We can. We want to make it general so that the computer can generalize a tree, uh, see, uh, uh, recognize a tree it has never seen before. So the idea is very much inspired by neurons, so you know more or less how a neuron looks like. It's actually there. So a neuron looks like you have a cell body with a synapse, and you have a neuron who goes out here, and when the synapse is here, what makes it? So you have like one cell here that gets a lot of different inputs, and then it gives one output. So we do the same thing in, 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 in uh, uh, and then you have many of these connected together. We do the same thing in computers. We have one no node here, which is just a small set of calculations that basically <coughs> <coughs> takes many inputs, well, anything between one and many inputs, and just sums them together, and then it gives an output function. And uh, it can be like uh, just a zero or one, or it can be some continuous function or something like that, or just some, something that's normally not just the sum of it, it's some calculation of it. Also, you have like a threshold, or you, you like a sigmoidal threshold or a straight threshold. And then you have many of these uh, in several layers. For instance, you have hidden, uh, also you have hidden layers, you have one input layer, one or several hidden layers, and one output layer. If you don't have any hidden layers, it's basically just weighting things together. Or you have more, even more than one output layer, it doesn't really matter. So every line here in this node has some kind of weight, and every node is basically just has a sum, is summing up all these numbers against the input here. So if you put in one to zero here, it has one times that weight plus zero times that weight, etc. And then it has some kind of function here, normally cut off, that says if this input is bigger than something, I give an output of one. And then the next layer. Right? So the key thing here is like the hidden market models is like we need to learn what are these weights and these cutoffs we should use. So this is basically done by training. It's not that we tell it what it be. So basically here we have, uh, yeah, it's very much inspired by the neural network. So here we have the same th thing. thing. Here we have basically you can have things actually going both ways on, but normally you have what's in one direction. You can have different strengths. So the field forward network, there's nothing, there are other networks, but the normal way that we use it is in the field forward network. So you have inputs here, hidden layers, and output layers. One or several. And it can be more than one hidden layer. But often, in our experience, we almost always use only one layer, because the training is much more complicated if you have, if you have more. Uh, that's the same slide again. And you have this you need a function here, so basically, at least two common points is just one step function. So basically, if it's high in this cutoff, you get one, otherwise, you get zero. Or you have some logistic narrow that has some sigmoidal function where you have some parameters, but it's also basically cutoff. So, one, one problem that this can solve that is not solved in syllabus statistics is the x or problem. You know what all x exclusive or means? From logic, so that means that I, I take either A or B, but not both, not none of them. So that's normal, uh, normal uh, um, logic. So if you represent this as uh, in a graph here, you have I should have an output of one. If either, so if you have you have zero and one as inputs or two different numbers. And if it's 0, 1, or 1, 0, I should have uh, given output of 1. But if it's 0, 0, 1, 1, I should give an output of 0. And of course, there's no straight line that can separate these two groups. Do you realize that? I cannot put this. I can give it some of the squares or something, and I can do it. Something, but I cannot, I cannot separate this by any statistical simple method. So there's no straight line that separates the white ones from the black ones. Or. I had to make a circle, so I had to need to go to one more dimension. But I can actually do it in a narrow network. I can put it like this. Uh, if I, this network here, which has 
These are the input weights. This is the cutoffs. So cutoffs are 1 minus 1, 5, 0.5, 0.5. And this is the inputs one and two, and this this works. Let's go through this. No, I didn't. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. So let's take this. <coughs> so that's. Okay. So we can show that basically if we have, if you make this network, so what do we have? We have two inputs, uh, and we have two hidden layers, and they are connected like that, like that, and like that, and like that, and then these are connected to one output node. Put the numbers 1 1.0, 1 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, minus 0 0.5, I guess, here, minus 1.5 there, minus 2 here, and minus, no, 1 here, sorry. And then a cutoff here of minus 0 0.5. So, if I have a zero zero input, I multiply uh, all these numbers with zero, so I get a zero zero input here over here also. So let's try to see if I get a space here. A zero zero input gives zero here and zero here. It gives zero here and both both nodes also, because basically they are zero times whatever is zero. But this is then I take minus 0 0.5 and minus 1.5 here. That means that I have um, uh, less than zero in both cases. That means I will get zero output here also. I uh, guess. That means I will get zero, in, uh, zero plus zero input here. So here we have zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. What? Sorry, it's not zero plus zero in both of these. And here I get zero plus zero, and I will get an output which is less than zero, which is the output which is zero. Um, and on the other hand, have an input which is one, one. Then basically the input here will be one plus one to both of these. So one plus one is two, minus one point five, which is, which is larger than one. And this is also larger than one. So I get one as output here. And for this one, I will get one, one, let me get there, and I have a minus two plus one, which is less than zero, means we get the output of zero. You follow me? And if I do one zero, I will get uh, input to this one, will be actually input to both of these, but well, one zero, zero, one doesn't matter, because input to both of these will be um, uh, one, one, so zero plus one and zero plus one, and this is, these are the same. And then this top one, 1 minus 1.5 is I will get the output of 0. And the bottom one, I will get the output of 1, which is 1 minus 1.5 is less than 0, but my 1 minus 0 0.5 is higher than 0. And then I will get 0 times minus 2, 0 plus 1 times uh, 1, which is 1, I take, which is higher than 0.5, which means I get the output of 1. So if I can learn the network to get these patterns, I can recognize the XOR problem. But this is not, this, this is why I know the numbers. Normally what you do is that you actually present data, sequence data or some other data, with an output layer, and then with, the answer, with the correct answer to the output. And then you present both positive and negative examples. And uh, uh, you fix the correct outputs numbers here. Uh, and you do what's called back propagation. Uh, 
So, okay, so in, if you have a positive example, it looks like that. If a negative example, it looks like that. For instance, in this case, you have two outputs, and you have zero, one, and one, zero. And, uh, well, well, basically, you calculate the output arrows, the difference between observer and the side output. You adjust the weights to decrease the arrows using what's called back propagation. Basically, it's just a minimization. You have to take the uh, derivative and uh, you follow it. And then you repeat this for every input, and then after that, you repeat it with uh, many times changing the uh, Chasing this, uh, decreasing this error every time. So you need to have some rules how much you should decrease, how much you should change it every time to do that, and how many times you should repeat it here. So this is uh, uh, takes some time because you need to train it every time and change the errors a little bit and then to keep on trying this. But it's I mean, normally tried some hundred or some thousand times, and it sort of works. Another alternative method is actually something called, it's called, it's called support vector machines. Uh, so this is basically, look here, you have, as I said at the beginning, you have two experiments, you have red and green dots, you want to separate them. And of course you can uh, find, you can think about this in many dimensions, but I can only visualize it in two. So of course if you have perfect separation, you can find a, a line or a plane, a hyperplane, separates this perfectly. So, so, so what support the machines do is they find this plane, and you can actually do this by training it. But you can find uh, you can find this here, and actually the ones that separate is best possible. So you can find many planes, but you have to find the ones that separate them best. I mean, there's many lines; they all separate them perfectly, but you can just find which one, which one, best one. However, in this case you can you can actually do it, but in many cases you can't. So, for instance. If you have uh, this type of data here, there's a measure here, and you have expression like over here, and the re red ones are here, and the green ones are on both sides of it, you can't separate them by a sim simple line. But if you take the square of them, so you take the square of the expression, you can separate them, because this is minus and plus reasons. And you can think of other functions that, that, that are also separate things much better. So you can go up to much higher dimensions. So this is what we call kernel function. So there are many different kernel functions. And these are, you can try them differently, and you can try to learn them and optimize them differently. <coughs> so instead of having something that you try to separate line like that, you can have some higher dimension space that is actually a strike, simple hyperplane. Well, there are a lot of different kernels, and there are some example things like this is if you use a linear kernel, you can get separation of this here. But you can also use polynomial kernels, you can get separations like that. Or it's called RBF kernel, you can get separations like this. And, uh, well, so there are yes, some comparison. Okay, so. Um, These are just, when you use this in practice, all you do is basically train, I mean, you run a program, you don't really care so much about it. But there's some key concepts here, and that's, one of the main problems here is actually that you teach the machine what it sees. And actually, you can, if you, both in neural network, I can add many, many more nodes, I can teach it to learn better and better. Or in uh, support like machines, I can have very complicated kernels and separate things like that. And so imagine this example. I could want to separate the blue from the red ones. <coughs> and uh, I would say that this black curve is quite good. It separates most of the black, blue from the red ones. But it misses something. There's a red one here, and there's a blue one there, and there's a red one there. So it's not perfect. But given enough time and freedom, the machine learning method could easily find this green line here, it separates the same things perfectly. But you really want to find it. Well, because I asked, the answer is no, of course you don't, you don't want to find it. Because the problem with that is that all there's a perfect separation here, it actually just 
learn to see what it has seen, it's not able to generalize. So really the machine, they're smart. If you give enough computer time, enough complexity, you can learn whatever you see. So next time you put some new data, this is actually the data you want to predict, then it ends up somewhere here, uh, or here maybe, <coughs> which is actually should be quite a strong blue one, but it's actually because you have all trained this one, it will be classified as a red one. So it will be very good at separating what it has seen and not very good at separating what it uh, should have unseen examples. So there is a classical example of a sort of similar problem. I think it was the American army who wanted to use neural networks or something to for detecting uh, tanks. So big panzer tanks that we're gonna uh, by the so patrolling the borders or in an, uh, or in a battlefield we're able to see them. So they went out and took a lot of pictures of uh, with tanks, without tanks. And then they calculated the number of things as the inputs for this for neural networks. They, they took the pictures and put the pictures in different ways and things like that and calculated them. And the machines were perfect. They were hundred percent correct. So then they went out to do uh, take new pictures. See, okay, how, we now we have this perfect training and it's perfect, it's fantastic this machine. We, we don't have to have any people watching and we have just left the computer do it. And it didn't work at all. So they took new pictures and absolutely completely nothing. They could not separate anything. Until someone suddenly realized that all the first pictures they taken of the tanks were taken on a sunny day and all the pictures without tanks were taken on a cloudy day. So the computer got very good at recognizing sunny and cloudy days. So really, I mean, the machine learns what you tell it to do. And um, there are also many, many examples in, in biology when uh, people do I mean, secondary structure predictions, some predictions where you can do, you can do perfect predictions, but really for unseen data it's completely useless. So that, that's why in homology often we need to use something called homology reduction. So that's one way to avoid overfitting. So one thing, one thing is to have a training set and test set, we'll talk more about it in a second, that are kind of uh, uh, representative and similar, but we also need to do what's called homology. Basically, we don't want in most cases, we don't want the, 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 the machine learning method to, le to learn homology. Because we know that proteins are homologous, have similar features, have the same stru secondary structures, etc. And we don't want to have... Um, but we want to do... We don't, this is not what we want to learn, because if, if you have homology, we can, we can use other methods. We can use profiles. But what we want to learn is the general features that are separate for this feature we want to look at. And so that's, we often want to only have one example for each, each family. So often you do is that you separate the data, you take away, you only keep one homolog from everything else. And the other thing is that we also have one training set and one test set, or sometimes we have the whole set to use it, but we divide it into different parts. The ideal way is that we take the whole set test set, we take out one example, we train on everything else, we predict this example, and then take out the next one. It's called jackknifing. But that was, takes a long time, long time because you need to train many times. So sometimes you have one training, one test set. Uh, so in short, uh, a training set should be large enough so you have enough data, otherwise you can't learn something. It should contain all possible classes in approximately equal amounts. Basically, you have no, no bias if you have very much one thing and not another thing. Because otherwise, of course, you the computers so smart they will learn this bias. Uh, so, uh, and you don't want to have two similar examples. And the two similar is something I often discuss with people in the field because people have used, in my mind, using things that are too similar. We had we we had the, ourselves did the mistakes or that we, well, we fixed it later, but 
we were going to recognize something called reentrant loops in membrane proteins. So they are So membrane proteins are proteins that sit in the membrane, and these are alpha helical type that we looked at. And a few of these have what's called reentrant loops. They have a loop that goes back into the membrane and out on the same side. The problem is that there are only well, depend, there are only maybe ten of these in the database. And the most famous examples are, are from aquaporin. They actually have two of these that goes and actually go up and meet like that. So they form almost like an extra helix like that. And so that, there were, in those days, there was maybe three or four echoporins in the database. And they have a very, very particular motif here. It's a NST. It's a very particular motif that is very conserved. <coughs> so you have echoporin 1, 2, 3, 4. I think it was 1, 4, and 5 in those days or something like that. And they are on the order of 25% sequence identity. So these are proteins that are, they are clearly homologous. They look the same, basically, but they are really on the borderline. And we didn't have so much data, so we did a homology reduction of 30% sequence identity. So basically, every pair that was more than 30% has more than 30% sequence identity to another pair. We took it away one of them. So we want nothing in our data that had more than 30% sequence identity. <coughs> Problem was here, I could point one, and these are less than 30%. They're more. They're, they're clearly homologous. And then we did the method here that actually was part of this method that should recognize its reentrant regions. We had more labeled our sequence data here with reentrant. And we want to recognize this. Of course, <coughs> it worked excellent for acroporins, which was about half our data. I think it was like it was 10 of reduction, but it was 5, and the 3 was like acroporin. So, of course, there was a very, very conservative motif there that it learned. So, if it, if it then went down to 20%, our method worked much worse. It didn't work not very well. So that's a typical example when you actually learn something which is not very useful. Right? It's probably useful for an acroporium, but it's not useful for anything else. Okay. Uh, I guess I can make a small short break. Okay, so a typical an another way to visualize this problem with overtraining that is maybe a bit more realistic is to look at this curve. So this is some kind of curve where you, just, you measure the error. So this is epoch, so number of training rounds. And this is an error, so basically how, how much, uh, what percentage is wrongly classified. And if you look at the training set, the more trained, the better it gets. I mean, it doesn't get down to zero, but it gets down to 0 0.07 or something. And, uh, but if you get independent test set, you see, in the beginning it also drops very fast, but then after some time it actually doesn't go any further down. So, and then it actually even starts going up. So that's basically meaning that the machine learns exactly what's in the training set but it cannot generalize. It cannot see things and know things. It loses performance there. Not that much, but a little bit at least. And if you don't spend all the time, it's much better to stop somewhere at 200 than to do at 500 in this case. The problem is that it's difficult to know exactly this without testing the test that you need to have an independent test to test it. Because the exact number of training rounds depends on your data. So often, well, often, often you have test set is quite frequently limited, so you don't have that much to test on. Uh, so you don't want to throw away data. So one way to, to get around it is to do cross validation. So basically you have one set of data that you divide in three or five or ten different groups and you use one training set or two training sets to test on one third, etc. So you, everything is you're supposed to train and test sets. One problem here is that the end you actually end up with three different predictors, three different methods that are slightly different, but they're developed in the same way, but they're slightly different. So you have to take the average of these or combine them some way. <coughs> Another important factor here is actually how do you measure when you do 
what is what is a good predictor, what is good. And of course, the easy way is just to calculate how many uh, are correctly classified. But you can see that that's so. Uh, you have positive examples and negative examples, and often you, you divide them. Somehow you have a cutoff here. So you separate what is the best cutoff. So it's better to have 100% correctly classified and uh, miss some group or the other way around. So you basically have the positive examples and negative examples, and you have the positive and the negative classified. They classified on one side, they classified the positive and negative. So there are some terms that are kind of important. One term is true positive, that's the ones that are supposed to be classified as positive and are classified as positive. And you have corresponding to true negatives, the ones that are classified as negative and should be classified as negatives. But then there are false positive ones, that means the ones that are should be classified as negatives but are wrongly classified as positive ones, and the corresponding false negative ones. And of course, just measuring the percentage correct is kind of okay, as long as these two groups are more or less the same size. But if one group is much bigger, so you say that you want to find, which is kind of common, you often want to find some small part in the whole data sequence database. You want to find, find some features that is not very common, so most of them you have much more negative examples than positive examples. And in that case, you might want to have other measures, because then basically, if you classify everything as negative, you might have 99% correct. So because, because there's so many examples. So then you have you often use what, precision and uh, other terms that are used. And precision or accuracy, which is basically how what fraction of the one you classify as, as positive or correct, and uh, record basically how many of the positive ones you want to find and such. There's some terms that are used. For example, one very common measure, which is actually quite good, is usually called MCC. So you define cut off and you take this formula here. It's called Matthews coordinate coefficient. So basically, it's, it's a number that goes from minus 1 to plus 1. And if it's plus 1, everything is perfect. If it's minus 1, everything is completely wrong. And 0 is basically random. And the good thing about this is that it doesn't really matter. It's less affected by this difference in size than if you are taking fraction correct ones. It really has an important... If it's one set, much smaller one, it's still useful. Otherwise, the way to do it often is to look at the rock curve. So receiver operating characteristics plot. So basically, you post plot the two positive rates versus the false positive rates or something like that. So true positive rate was basically the number of true positive divided by the number of true positive plus false negatives. Basically uh, basically how many of the two how many of the positives do you find? What fraction is you find? Divided by the false positive rate, which is basically how many of the false negatives do you classify as oxygen uh, positive one. So the ideal curve would of course classify all the positives first and all the negatives later. So you would have something that goes up like that and like this. And the random one would follow just this curve here. So in this case, they measure three different curves, methods. So the net chop, top, and protease. And so you don't know which one is best. You see, all are better than random, but none are extremely good in whatever data set they used. And you see, you see that at some kind of if you have 20 percent false positives, you find about four, uh, find about four percent of all the true positive ones. So it's not that that good, I would say. But you can also see that maybe uh, black and green one a bit better here. But so maybe if you if you if you want a low false positive rate, which is often common, you know, then many black and green methods are better than the red one. But it's not a big difference. You can measure the area on these curves, with the rock 50 score is kind of often the area on the curve. But often, often you're interested in the low false positive rate, because often you don't want to find classify something wrong. You better miss something than classify something wrong, particularly as these are many more. Okay, so now the questions. Now we want to do this on sequences. As I said, with the inputs we had here, so far as numbers, we didn't have it we had before. Plus ones and zero. So you have, we need to turn our sequences into numbers. Uh, so we, we can do that. So how do you get? Well, of course, you can just take a is one is b. Well, we don't have b. C is two, etc. But that's not a very good measure because we know that in the neural network 
we have here, we had an input, so let's have an input here which is position 1. If A is, is 1, and uh, C is 2, and D is 3, etc. That means that C is just, and then we take this one, and we multiply with some weights, we take this number here, called X times some weight, X1, weight 1, weight 2, etc. That means that C will just get twice as now more important as, as A, and that's not, not what we want. So we want to classify them into groups. And normally what you do is, one easiest way to do it is what you use is what's called sparse encoding. So that basically, if you have a system, you basically have 20 inputs for each letter. So you basically have an input here, which is 20 numbers. And if you have an alanine, you have a 1. If you have a system, and then everything else zero, and if you have cysteine, you have zero, one, and everything else zero, etc. So one, so that's called spot encoding. So that's basically have ones and zeros for everything, uh, everything is zero except one that is one. Uh, except for the minus you have. There are other ways to do it also. You can, for instance, uh, classify amino acids in terms of physical chemical properties. We can have like size, charge, so often just like six dimensions you normally use. And then you can classify them as some number in six dimensions. If you, if you, that's perhaps very useful if you think that it's really physical chemical properties that is not important. In my experience, in most cases, it doesn't really matter. You, know, you get more or less the same performance, but this is quite easy, but of course it, it means that you have quite a lot of inputs. So like an input with short three sequence looks like that. So yes, M, A, S, L is 0, 6, 0, 0, 1, this is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and we want to predict some feature. We want maybe, we, of course, if we have a specific motif here, we say this is the motif we want to recognize, and we have some variations of this that are maybe uh, slightly different. And then we have these 20 times 5 inputs. So then we can just take this and train things to be ones and zeros. The problem is, of course, we. we, we, we we don't also know exactly what this is, so we don't know if this feature is exactly the same length, or if it's different lengths. Particularly in negative examples, where we should we take every sequence or every combination of five sequences, how should we do, etc. So we often what we do is that we have our amino acid sequence. And then we have some labeling. So some methods say here is the motif we want to recognize. So this is maybe positive examples. And these are the negative examples. And maybe another. Uh, and maybe positive examples here also. And maybe have another one here which is a negative example the way. So I can then I take a window of amino acids to recognize this one. So this is one input number, and I'll shift the window one step, and then click on this one. So that is what is called a uh, uh, sliding input window. So, the, so basically I take every window here, so if, we, if I have a window size of 7, I start with position 4, so the first window is M, A, S, L, V, L, and that's why it's A, F, A, S, V, L, V, L, etc. Because I mean, this is not all the same, because even if 6 out of 7 are I mean, the same, I shift the one step, so the network has to learn new things. So then, then I can basically say, okay, I want to recognize this part here. Uh, so I do this here, so this is my first window, and then, then this, this is either a positive or negative number. Okay, so let's go to this biological example. So target P, which was developed in this lab by uh, Olaf Monson. So the problem is we want to predict the subcellular representation of proteins based on their amino acid sequence. So we want to take, as you asked, we want to take a protein and ask where in the cell does it end up. 
And in this case, we don't want to do it. There have been other people doing that, but this is kind of the idea here, so it was used to biology that we know. And uh, it was based on earlier work, which was called C0P, so that's where the P comes from. And so they, they, also, they kind of limit themselves to the secretary pathways, or, or the, 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 the partial cell that has signal peptides. So that's the ER, or secretory pathways, so that's basically everything that goes into the membrane and fold the ER out and exports outside the cell. Mitochondrions, chloroplasts, and everything else. There are, of course, you can use uh, nucleus or nucleolian, you can use other pathways, etc. You can even subdivide these mitochondria into in and outer membranes, such like that. But then you need to use other types of signals that are very different in their um, biology, so that's, they didn't do that. So basically, the problem is like that. You have mRNA transcribed here, and there are some sorting machineries. And you have chloroplasts, mitochondria, and the secretory pathways, the ER Golgi. Yeah. Wow, this is also transgender problems. This is the general idea of a eukaryotic cell. Of course, chloroplasts only exist in plants and not in others. So if you don't have a plant, you shouldn't predict it. <coughs> and then the machinery here is basically that you have a prior sequence that is cleaved out later that is doing the sorting. So that is known, or was known, and has been experimentally studied, and there might be a Nobel Prize maybe 10 years ago. Maybe even less. So that's uh, this machinery. So that's, that's how this works. So it's called a signal peptide if you go to the secretion. It's called a mitochondrial target peptide for the mitochondrial or chloroplast target peptide if it goes to chloroplast. So this is N terminal sequence here to the cleave. So they're, they're related, but they're not uh, uh, very strong. So before that, you had kind of patterns. So you have Something describing it, you have here a single peptide about 25 amino acids. You have a pattern which are some IV, X, and AC. Here you have some mitochondrial target pattern, you have some R minus 10, R minus 3, R minus 2. So you have arginine rule, so there's some arginine compositions. The chloroplast is longer, it's 50 amino acids long, so about that. And you have a VRA, AA motif somehow. So, how do you set up with it? So, first, so the first thing you do is, is you go to SwissProt. And you look for the annotations of proteins that are annotated to be in this different subset of organization. You try to ignore everything which is pre predicted to be there, but you want to have, to want to have experimental evidence for it. So Olaf sat down and probably looked at hundreds of abstracts of papers, well, not really readable papers, but looked through that there was some experimental data for it. And that makes a big difference actually, to go through the data, because really, if you just trust what's in the database, you will have some errors, probably five times some errors. And then it is multiple sequence alignment. Well, I didn't know the multiple sequence alignment because you know this is the end terminal. But still, you need to vary the length. So this is not exact 25 amino acids. It could be 20 to 30, something like that. So you, you can't start aligning them from the end terminals. Because then you will get the very. So if you have the peppers here, And they are, so, that, so this is the number of target peptides. But they are actually cleaved here. This is the cleaved site. But, but this is something, in the same fact, this is 20 to 30 amino acids long, so a bit variation. So if you train on this one, this, this is actually one of the motifs you want to find. You want to find this, but it's an important motif you want to. But this, if it's for a network then, if you have marked your chain data, you will have a positive example here, 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 here. But if they are aligned like that, you don't know when they are, I mean, if you, you don't know which of these are the positive examples. So you want to align them al along this, along the cleavage site. That is annotated in the, was annotated in the database. Might not be perfect, but at least you have the idea. So if you do that, and the first thing you do is do the sequence loggers. Remember this? So they look like that. So for the signal peptide, you have a quite strong peak here at the cleavage site. So this cleavage site is this uh, line here, which has an alanine, serine, uh, glycine signal. The strongest peak here, 
you can see that after that is basically no information at all. Because that's of course the protein itself, and there are different proteins, they are not at all related. You can also see that, well, it is something now in the set position directly after. If that is possible due to uh, this wrong annotator or something else, I don't know. But you can see even in the position before, there's no signal, but two steps before, there's very strong, or quite strong anionic welding, then it drops again, and then there's a general trend in this region that you have a lot of leucines, valines, phenylalanines, and hydrophobic amino acids. So this is kind of the Me measure you want to recognize. In magic color talk, the first thing is it's much weaker signal. There's nothing really, really strong here. This is has a two and a half bits information. This is up to less than one. You, but you see these tendencies R minus two, R minus three, and R minus ten. There, so there are tendencies that two, two, three, and ten positions before the clear size. There is an ordinary. This is not at all as, as hydrophobic, it's much less hydrophobic than this one, than this one. It's, it's clearly much weaker. But yeah, I think there's a more tendency to be hydrophobic also, I want you to see what I mean, that's done. Okay, see there maybe. And then, for the chloroplast one, you have this AA motif, that is over there. So there's a lot of alanines there, and there's a valium positive in my position minus three. And otherwise, there's a lot of green amino acids, which I guess are something like Cysteine and tyrosine, something like that, I can't really see. But still, it's, it's, a, it's a much weaker signal. So, just by looking at this plot, you would say that the signal peptides are probably easiest to find. So, this is all from plant. And you, so you would be thinking, oh, this is very not impossible to make particular but you don't have it, you don't have the ne negative examples. You don't have the examples of things that are not. Uh, don't. But how would I, if I want to be smart, so what are the signals I want to recognize? Basically, there are two types of signals. One is actually, that's particular here, you have hydrophobic signals, so this one you want to recognize. And then there's this cleavage side signal, and here is also a very strong cleavage side signal. And it's not exactly at that, but it's in the vicinity here. And here there's also something cleavage side signal. So you kind of two different types of signals you want to, to, to identify. So as I said, uh, step one was to prepare data. You take all data from this plot, check literature for cleavage site reliability. So basically, have they, have they done an experiment to verify that this is the cleavage site that is cleaved off? This is the position. And there are cases when the data actually is not what's in the paper, because the paper somehow has mistyped it there, so there are errors, etc., etc. And then you do homology reduction. So you take away things that are too similar to each other. In this case, it is some time ago, so you use Swiss plot version 48.5, which has had 200,000 sequences. Today, Swiss plot had no order of a million sequences. And here you have these features that you look for. So this is uh, identity, this is a protein, the feature. It has chloroplast, trans peptide here you look for, trans chloroplast, position 1 to 55, uh, and then so the rest is not important, so, and then the sequence. So if you have find this feature trans peptide here, you know that at position 55, you have a cleavage by the side there. So to remove the tumor similar sequences, you did all your data set. You took you run Smith Waterman with some parameters. You compared with various scores to so some extreme value distribution to get the similarity cutoff, count the neighbors with proton, if a parallel line score is higher than cutoff, remove it with the highest number of neighbors, and then you keep on the and you have no, no neighbors. So take away basically uh, you do that until you have nothing in the database set is more similar than this cutoff to anything else. Often people use the secret identity, but in this case they use a better match which, which was actually statistically estimate of it. But still they, most people use the secret identity. So at the end they end up with these data sets. So they had, end up with some few hundred. Uh, well, this is the numbers before homology reduction, this is what, what after ones. So 
So also from the direction of between 100 and 370, plant data prep proteins in different in the different group four groups. You have chloroplast, mitochondria, single peptide, or other. In particular, you in other in non plants that you have very many, you have more data and you have much much more non uh, data. So the idea is to basically do something, something like this. That you make actually three different networks, one for each class. Four class, mitochondria, single class. So they are different. You want, there are different features of difference. You want to train them. And then you make some kind of integrated network that actually takes the output of this network as input to this, and then you make a prediction. And also a reliability measure. So basically, of course, you could just take this number directly, but you had you had to somehow put some number into it. So the output of this first base network looks like that. So basically, in this case, actually, they do not use the the signal very much from the view um, side. So you basically have a sequence number here, so sequence 0 to 100, I guess it is. And so they the label all the data. If they, if they have a single pepto data, single pe pepto example, so in this case, in the, in the case we had a chloroplast transfer peptide that was from position 150. So this is the protein looks like that. This is one, and it was 55, and then basically you, you label it with a C all the way here. And another example, you maybe have a single peptide, that is maybe 1 to 25, and then you label it with an S all the way here. That's that. So you have a label uh, something that is none or other, you have, the, you have no labels, or you have labels here or everything. So you take the first 100 residues, because that's or something like that. Maybe it's 20, 40, 60, 80, or even, maybe it's even 120. And you have this labeled data, so the network is trained, so the chloroplast network is trained to separate these C's from everything else. So it trains at a 1 if it's regular as a C and C of everything else. So in this case, this peptide, it has a very high number, and then it drops here at position 60 more or less. In the single peptide, it has, it's low here, it has a bit high peak here in the middle. And in this one, it has a bit of a uh, also a bit high peak, but this is clearly the strong signal in this case. Uh, so then they had this integrated network that basically get one number here at the least at the end. The, the integrated network basically takes these three numbers. So there are 300 numbers here that you put, put in and uh, learn just to train one of the four classes. So this is just the input to the second layer. And uh, then you get an output that looks like that in this case. So in this case you had one protein that is a certain length and it has f uh, four probabilities basically. A chloroplast probability, a mitochondrial probability, and a synopatic probability, and other probability. Right, that's not only the probability because they don't add up to one, but score at least. So the first one here is quite clear to be a chloroplast. Second one also. This one is a bit more uh, diffuse. It's about 50 50 between chloroplast and mitochondria. And this one is clear to be other. So then you have, you have a depletion, is called plus four plus mitochondria. This is a real reliability, I don't know exactly what it is, but anyway, this is not, not the number. And yeah, that's it. So how did you obtain this? So how good is it? So what they did, of course, they, 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 how did they try it? They tried many different neural networks. Uh, so then you different learner is but how much you learn of each method, how much do you train it, to train it. There's three different ones. 
They had a sliding window, so when you look at this, you look at not on one position, you look at the sliding window of anything between 7 and 55 residues. He had trained it between 20 and 100 rounds, and you had between 0 and 10 hidden lay nodes. And then you use the best combination. And you got some, so basically, so there was a lot of different trials and errors. You tried a lot of different things. And uh, it's basically impossible to predict what is the best of these versions. Where is this? Yeah. Mm, yes, please, someone, please. So in total, in this test set in the plant, they had 940 proteins. In total, 85% was correct. But if you remember this test set, it was uh, quite dominated by well, it was most mitochondrial and single peptides. Not so many others. Um, you have... Uh, well, this is not really readable because it's something screwed up here. But you have chloroplast, other the chloroplast peptide, 120, so 85 percent of these were predicted to be chloroplast also. The mitochondrial one, 300 out of 360, whatever it is, was predicted there. The sinopeptide was 91 percent. So, we, as, I, as I said in the beginning, from the peptides, the sinopeptides are better predicted because 91 percent of these are correctly predicted. And you can see also the confusion between these groups. This is chloroplast, chloroplast is quite high here. So 40 out of the 300 mitochondria are pretty chloroplast, but chloroplasts are pretty more than more. 14 of these, 120 to 10%. But a bit more than 10% of these are classified as the other one. And it's also some cross-validation over here. By most of the single peptides are classified as other. And by the other, you can see that some of these are classified as chloroplasts and mitochondria, not so many as single peptides. You know, 85% correct of these. Uh, you see that you, you predict to be too many chloroplasts because only 6 69 percent if you look at specificity so basically out of the proteins you classify as chloroplasts how many of these are correct and it's only 70 percent there so this is probably the worst number you have here Actually, bring that a bit. Well, uh, that's how you organize. So here the chloroplasts are 69% are wrongly classified, while uh, 90% are, are the 69% uh, of the uh, chlor uh, producer chloroplasts are correct, while 96% of the signal peptides ones are. Shall we? This is not in one place. So, as a summary, 
of this kind of what I'm trying to tell you. So, from multiple sequence alignments, from basic sequence signals, we can try to detect patterns, we can try to extract information. And one way to do that is basically, basically we want to find, find non holy patterns. We can also use the same kind of machine learning methods to analyze other complex data. Uh, we talked about neural networks and machi- uh, support vector machines. The idea here is that you, you learn from examples. You really try to learn from examples. You don't learn from uh, from telling the machine what to do. And it's very, very important to have good training and test stuff. And good, I mean, is it representative, large enough, non homologous not biased in any, any way, basically. You can use the data set, either you use training and test set, or you can use cross validation, also called jackknifing, where you take out one example and test everything else. And if you don't do it correctly, you will have a problem of overtraining. It will overbreed things. And then once you do this, if you decide what to do, there are lots of different methods you can use. One of the popular tools of the Vika, but there are implementations in R and MATLAB. There are good implementations in Python also. So there are, and there are other methods like random forests, etc., etc. So there are a lot of different methods to do it. And it actually, to use them, it's quite simple. I use for Office SVM Lite, for instance. It's just, you run it, and you get the results out. It's just you have to prepare the data, it's the main problem. And in most cases, the key method to get good performance is not to use the best method. It's really to represent the problem in the right way. So like in this case, when you did the target P, really you could have thought of making whatever computing method you wanted to have, but it was really this key idea of having these kind of outputs that are important for uh, Right. They're representing this way they made it perform very well. That you have like three in the whole three to hundred residues. You could have thought about doing it completely different ways. You could have taken them in acid composition, you could have taken uh, tried to focus on the cleavage size, you made one prediction on each number, etc. etc. And you could, could get that and get the performance that was probably not as good. And you could, but you, it was really to understand how what is the scene you're looking for. And that they got very much from this sequence logos. If you look at this, you can see clearly how I want to find this set pattern here. Maybe that one. Okay, so that's all for today. <laughs>